Well, good morning. Um, just want to give you a summary or remind you of where we've been at as we're going to be concluding our study of the book of Titus this morning. Two weeks ago, we looked at, you know, gospel leaders, and we talked about how leaders in the church are supposed to be formed primarily by the gospel, not by the way the world defines leadership. And then last week, we talked about gospel doctrine and how the gospel should inform our beliefs and really how that then comes out in the way that we live. And this week, we're looking at chapter 3, which is all about gospel works. It's tied very closely to what we looked about last week, and it's really about how our, the gospel should inform all the way that we live, or that because we have been saved and transformed by Jesus, it should change the way that we live or our work. And primarily, what Paul is focused in on in chapter 3 is this idea that the way that we treat people reveals whether or not we really believe the gospel. And the way that we treat them reveals what we actually think about the gospel. And so what we're going to do this morning as we look at chapter 3 is we're going to look at um, three different people's work. First, we're going to look at our work, then we'll look at God's work, and then we'll conclude in looking at our enemy's work and how he tries to keep us from doing the work of God. Um, so if you are able, I'd invite you to stand as we read from Titus 3 uh, from God's Word this morning. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so we might be justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning them once and then twice, have nothing to do with them, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and he is self-condemned. And when I send to you Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come with me to Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their way, seeing that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and to not be unfruitful. All of you who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. The grass withers and the flower fades, but God's word stands forever. Let's pray. God, I ask that you would be here this morning. Um, Lord, that you would help us to, to focus on you and your word, push out all of the distractions, all of the things that have been going on this week and are coming in front of us in the coming week. Lord, would we be attentive and listening not to my words, but to your words. Show us how to do work that is fueled by the gospel. That's not trying to earn it. We pray these in your holy and precious name. Amen. Man, you can be seated. So first, we're going to talk about our work and what, what we should be doing. And so your, your first blank is that we need to treat others like God treats you. Treat others like God treats you. This is really the central theme or the idea of this whole chapter. You know, last week we talked some about good works and or talking of gospel doctrine, right? How what we believe is what we live out every day. And so if we actually believe something, it should come out in how we live. And so Paul builds on that idea and says, okay, well, so since that is true, here's things you need to be doing. Three times in this chapter, he says, devote yourself to be good, to be ready for every good work, devote yourself to good works, devote yourself to good works. And the question is, okay, what kind of good works? And Paul's focus is the good works and how we treat other people. And the way that we treat other people in these relationships is born out of how God treats us, right? We do these good works not because we're trying to earn God's grace. 
We don't do it because we're trying to earn salvation. If I do enough good things, if I'm good enough, if I build up, you know, my side of the scale, then I'll get to go to heaven. That's not why we do it. We do it because Jesus has already done everything for us. Because Jesus has freely given us grace be, that we don't deserve because of his mercy, because of how he saved us. Now we do good works because we just can't help it. Out of gratitude, out of love. And specifically, how do we do this here? We treat other people how God has and how God does treat us. And he starts off in an interesting place, not the place any of us would choose in verse 1 right away. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. To be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Ouch. You know, first, Titus needs to remind them, this is, implies they're prone to forgetting this information, right? It's not on the forefront of their minds. And who are the rulers and authorities that they're to be reminded to submit to? Well, it's the government. That's who Paul reminds them. As Christians, we are to be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. To be submissive and obedient to the government. I notice I haven't heard any amens to that, <laughs> right? In fact, I felt confident enough that four days ago when I wrote down on my manuscript, I wrote down there will not be any amens, so we can, we can talk about this, right? You know, lots of you probably have life verses, right? Or there are verses that you have that have been close to your heart. Maybe they're things that have brought you comfort in dark days, or they're verses that have really fueled your spiritual life and your walk with Christ. I doubt this is any Christian's life verse, Definitely not in Oklahoma, right? To be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, yet here it is in our Bibles. And so we have a choice. And this is the first thing Paul mentions when he says, do good works. First one you do when you're treating other people, submit to the government. So we have a choice to make. We can decide, are we going to submit to God's word? Am I going to listen to God? Will I be obedient to God? Or am I going to ignore it and do what I want? The Christian attitude is one of submission. It's not submission if you want to. It's not submit as long as you feel like it. He just tells them submit. You know, basically everybody's had plenty of opinions on the government over the last two years, right? During COVID, it seems like that's all people want to do is spend our time arguing with each other about what you or I shouldn't do or what the government should or shouldn't do. So this verse is both timely and we're probably frustrated and just want to ignore it. Okay, I want to ignore it. If I'm being honest, I wanted to rearrange how I went through the passage. I didn't have to start here because this isn't a great place to begin a sermon. And I want to ignore it because why? It pricks all of our consciences. It confronts our sin. It confronts our idolatry. At least it pricks mine. Remember, too, the kind of government Paul's commending Christians to submit to. It's not a wonderful, beautiful democracy. Or it's the Roman government. This is the government that's actively imprisoned Paul. Several times. This is the government that killed our Savior. Paul is being actively persecuted by the government, not the fake persecution we kind of complain about sometimes here in America. Real persecution. Paul doesn't start up a, a fundraising drive or campaigning. Paul isn't trying to throw a coup and to overthrow this illegitimate government. That is wrong. What does he say? He says, be submissive to rulers and authorities. Be obedient. We're not to be submissive just when we like it. And Paul doesn't give any exceptions here, which none of us like. That's what all of us want to do immediately, right, is run for, well, okay, I don't like that, so what are all the times I don't have to obey this? Let me find those quickly so I can not submit and sit under the uncomfortableness of God's word. Well, the only exception really, right, would be if the government mandated that we had to sin or worship idols, okay? And not every decision that you don't like is the government mandating you to sin. Sorry. And we know that's the exception, so then we try to make everything that. Well, that, that's wrong and I don't like it, so therefore I don't have to submit to anything. Even when rules and laws are passed down by evil men like Caesar and like Nero, we're supposed to submit. Part of why? Well, Jesus showed us love even when we didn't deserve it. Jesus didn't wait till we were worthy. So we did work that was pleasing to him and to, to did everything that was right and met his approval. Jesus took the first steps towards us in grace that we didn't deserve. And so one of the ways that we live out the gospel is how we submit to the authorities that God has placed over us, evil or not, righteous or not, doing good things or not. 
we submit to him. I'm going to move on because I don't like that verse any more than many of you do, but I'm, that's, it's in there and you need to wrestle with it. And Paul continues and he keeps stepping on our toes in verse 2. He doesn't stop. Speak evil of no one. That seems fairly clear, no one. Okay, in Greek, you know what no one means? It means no one. Okay, you can go do all the word studies you want. Look at it. It means don't speak evil about anybody. Not our enemies. Not even God's enemies. Not the person who frustrates you. Not that public figure that you can't stand. This has to do with speaking evil of no one. And it doesn't have anything to do with, well, do they deserve to have evil spoken about them or not? That's not the point. Because of the immeasurable love that God has shown to us, we're to show that love and that grace to people who are undeserving. There's plenty of people I'm sure all of us want to speak evil about. There's at least one person you can think of you want to speak evil about. God's Word tells us no. And Jesus never speaks evil about us, though there is plenty he could say that would be right and would be deserved. God knows our darkest thoughts, our deepest sins, the things that we are most ashamed of. And yet, he refuses to speak evil about us, even if it would be true. But the devil stands before God, and he speaks evil about us night and day. Revelation 12.10 tells us, he, the accuser accuses the brethren day and night before the throne. What does God do? Does God listen to it and say, yeah, you're right. You're right. I should say those things about them too. No, God casts them down. He goes, as Paul goes a step further and says, avoid quarreling. So speak evil of no one and avoid quarreling quarreling. Don't just not be argumentative. We're commanded to actively try and avoid arguments and quarrels. Why? So many of them are foolish and a waste of time, right? We just both want to yell at somebody and we don't really care who's listening or what they think. I just want to yell and they just want to yell and then we're just yelling and nothing is accomplished whatsoever. You almost never change anybody's mind during a quarrel, right? Even if you have all the facts and everything's right and they're so wrong, it doesn't change anything. And usually what happens in a quarrel is the other person we're quarreling or fighting or arguing with turns into our frust the object of our frustration, even if they weren't before. Christians are to be people who avoid quarrels. We refuse to fight. Even when other people egg us on, even when other people say things that you just think, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, I have to correct them and tell them how dumb they are, surely that will change their mind. It never will. I can almost promise you that. Even when people are getting our blood pressure boiling and our heart is beating faster and faster, we're supposed to refuse to fight. And instead, we're called, don't be, quar don't be quarrelsome, be gentle. To be a gentle people. Instead of a people who fight. As someone's trying to quarrel with us, we respond with gentleness instead. And furthermore, in case you haven't got it by now, Paul continues and, and ends it with, and show perfect courtesy towards all People. Again, this is towards everyone. Paul couldn't be more clear. We're to treat everybody like God treats us, to show them grace. The grace that God has given us that we did not deserve should flow out of us even towards people that don't deserve it in our judgment. Even towards those people that we don't want to be gentle towards, we think they need something harsh. They, they need to have their table overturned. They need to get you know, some discipline, and it's going to come from me. No, instead we need to show them the grace of God. It doesn't just go towards the people who are easy to love. Jesus says, hey, the world can love its friends and those that are kind to it. What, what does that mean? If the only people that we show the grace of God towards are people who are gracious to us, that doesn't say anything about the gospel. That makes us just like everybody else. But if we can show grace and kindness to people who don't deserve it, to people who are spitting in our face, that shows gospel. That reveals something different. So I don't know where you struggle here on, on our work, right? Paul gives us five different instructions. Submissive to the government, obedient, ready for good work, speaking evil of no one, avoiding quarrels, being gentle, showing perfect courtesy towards all. That is a lot. And what I invite you to do is don't write all five of those or all of those down and try and accomplish all of those this week because you, you'll fail. You won't do it. It'll just be another you know, New Year's resolution that you can't make. But maybe look at one of those. Pray and ask the Lord, Lord, what is one of these areas that you want me to work on this week? What is one of these places that I need to grow in? And try and chase that. Just focus there. So that's part of our work, but let's turn like Paul does and look at God's work. We've already hinted at it, but I want to dive deeper in here. And so our, our next 
spot is that God treats undeserving sinners with undeserved grace. God treats undeserved or undeserving sinners with undeserved grace. That is what God did. That is what God does right now. And that is what God will continue to do until all of eternity is show undeserving sinners undeserved grace. The reality is that this is all of us. All of us in this room and everyone outside of this room are undeserving sinners. Look at verse 3. For we, we ourselves, were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days out in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Maybe you want to stop and say, whoa, 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 not, not me. Maybe, maybe some of those, but I don't know about all that, Paul. Maybe that was just you. Say, sure, I was a sinner, maybe I don't deserve it, but that, that's just, this is harsh. But this is what all of us were before God's grace met us and before we gave our lives to Jesus. The most holy and spiritually mature among us. This was true of us. The worst, most depraved sinner you can think of. This is true of them. This is the reality for all of us. Look at the depths of our sin. We were ourselves once foolish and disobedient. We were fools. You ever watch a fool make a decision and you just kind of scratch your head? Why would you do that? And you just look at it and, you say, and then they come to you later. Oh, I don't know what happened. He said, I know what happened. I told you that was a foolish decision. And if you did it, this is what would happen. And then you did it anyway. How can you be so foolish, right? You've had people in your life like that. That's what Scripture says was true of us. All of us without Jesus were just fools making bad decisions chasing our sin, and we were disobedient, we never obeyed. It's not just that we wouldn't submit and obey government or earthly leaders, it's that we would refuse to obey the King of Kings, refuse to obey our God. And we were, le we were like bratty little children who never listened to their parents, no matter how often the right thing was explained to them. Apart from Jesus, that's what we are. And we were all led astray, deceived by sin in the world. We bought the lie of the serpent. Well, did God really say that? Now, does God really want good for you? You know what? If you just, if you just followed me, just give in to your sin, that's going to lead you somewhere better. It's going to lead you to something much greater than God could ever give you. All of us, apart from Jesus, are led by that lie. We think that if we could just bite into that forbidden fruit, then our lives will be improved. If we just, this God doesn't want me to have this, but if I just do it, it'll make everything better. We're undeserving sinners who were led astray. We're also slaves to various passions and pleasures. So as we were led astray by our sin, deceived by our sin, we were then enslaved by our sin and trapped with no way out. We thought, well, I'll follow my heart and do whatever it leads me to do, and then I'll be truly free. But the heart, apart from Jesus, is deceitfully wicked. And it traps us. We find ourselves in chains. We're like rats tricked by a piece of cheese on a trap. And there's no way out. Like addicts who do anything to meet their passions. But when we chase our sin, we can't ever get out. That's why we need Jesus. And so what do we do with our time? Passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Miserable. Is that around envious of what God had given other people? Wishing that God had given that to us. God, why did you give them that and I don't have anything? And anger and bitterness takes root in our hearts. Our lives aren't defined by loving one another unconditionally. It was defined by being jealous and hating other people. And alone without true community. That's not a great picture of a, a good person, is it? That's not a picture of anybody I want to be around, but that's a picture of an undeserving sinner. Maybe somebody even comes to your mind as you read this. You think, ah, oh, I know somebody that describes Oh, I can think of somebody that's like. But the reality, again, in verse 3, for we ourselves were all of these things. This is what all of us in the room were without Jesus. Or could be without Jesus. Every single one. Not one of us deserves grace. If you met somebody like this, that'd be somebody you'd want to invite to lunch to hang out with more. That'd be somebody you'd want to invite to come move in your house and your guest room and spend more time with you. Man, that wouldn't be somebody I'd even want to be kind towards. Let alone would that be somebody I'd want to die for and give my life for. 
Definitely wouldn't be somebody I'd want to give the greatest blessing ever known or somebody that I'd want to adopt into my family. And yet, that is what God, through Christ, does for us. God treats undeserving sinners with undeserved grace. None of us deserve any of these things, and yet this is what God does. Verse 4, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Jesus saving us was simply because of His love and His kindness. We didn't deserve salvation. None of us did. Yet God gives it. Not because you were so great. It wasn't like, you know, draft night in one of the sports. Oh, they're, they're my number one pick. I have to have them. They're so amazing. Look at, look at how great they are, how awesome their works. They're so righteous. I've got to save them because they're so lovely. It's now there's nothing lovely about us whatsoever. And yet God chooses to love us and died for us anyway. The mercy and the grace that God gives is undeserved. And why? Just because of His goodness and His loving kindness. In verse 5, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. It is laughable to imagine that our works would save us. It is laughable to imagine that if you did enough good things, that then God would just have to let you into heaven to hang out with Him forever. Go through, uh, read the law. If you want to be saved by your works, you have to be perfect in everything, all the time, forever, from birth to death. Even when you do good things, you need to do them with perfect motives at every time. It means when you respond to someone in kindness, it can't be a second where you have to catch your breath and think, okay, I don't want to be, but I'm going to be now. No, you've got to immediately just respond with love. None of us can do that. So we're all wrecked by sin. None of us are saved because of our works. We are saved not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy. God shows mercy to sinners. And His mercy continues. He goes a step further. By the washing of the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, the whole Trinity and Godhead is here involved in showing mercy to undeserved sinners. We are washed clean by God. That the stench and the, the grossness of our wickedness and sin is washed off of us. Like Isaiah said, our, our sins oh, once were scarlet, now we're white as snow. God removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. And God, regenerate, by the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes and regenerates us. He makes us born again. He doesn't just wash us clean from our sins. He gives us new life. The regeneration of the Holy Spirit, it's not like a visit to the hospital where like they just take care of your sickness and then, yeah, then you go back. He doesn't just give us a clean slate and then try again, don't mess it up this time. That's not the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. He washes and He removes the sickening power of sin in our life and then gives us a brand new life. This is why... Salvation is called being born again. It's new life. It's not just, hey, your old life isn't as messed up anymore. Now try not to do that again. It's no, we're new creation. More mercy and more grace to undeserved sinners. Verse 7, so that being justified by His grace in 7, so then we are justified by God. That's why Jesus cried out on the cross. As the blood rolled down his body and off of his feet and it spilled onto the ground and he cried out, it is finished. It is done. Their sin is dealt with. No longer are they undeserving sinners. Now they are made righteous. Because of the work of Jesus on the cross, all of us have been justified and our justification means in the eyes of God we are not wicked, undeserving, filthy sinners. We're beloved sons. Beloved daughters, God doesn't look at us and see our sins and our failures. He looks at us through the blood of Jesus. Not because of anything we do, and He sees children that He loves and He cares for. We have been justified by God. More grace we don't deserve. His grace continues in seven. So that being justified by His grace, it's all grace and grace and grace, we might become heirs. We're made heirs in the kingdom of God. We're a part of his royal family. You're not a runt. 
You're not the last kid at the end that when everyone else gets the good bit of the inheritance, there's nothing left for you. You're not the last one who got let in by God's grace or his blood before it all ran out and there wasn't enough left for anybody. No, no, no. You were made an heir. When you think of heaven and the kingdom of God coming down to earth, don't believe that the beauty and the wonder and the rewards and everything good that comes with it is just for other people. It is for you. You've become an heir of the kingdom. You will inherit the beauty and the promises of God, not because you deserve it, not because of anything awesome that you have done. You don't. And yet it's yours because of who your Father is through Jesus. We are heirs by His grace. We might become heirs. Verse 7 continues, according to the hope of eternal life. And these undeserving sinners that God is giving all this undeserving grace, now they have hope of eternal life that death is not the end. Death is in front of us. Death is all around us. Death continues to steal from us over and over. But we can have hope even in the face of death. Christian, you don't have to fear Death, because death is not your end. We have hope of eternal life and that our life will continue forever, that death is but a moment. A door we pass through as we continue on to be with Jesus forever. After death passes, we will be in the presence of our Savior. And even after that, there is resurrection to come and a glorious body that awaits us as our Savior comes and renews the heavens and the earth. What a wondrous hope that we have. Our hope isn't that this life will be the greatest it's ever been and that we will have no suffering and no pain and no death. Our hope is that, yes, suffering may come. Yes, pain may come and yes, death may come if our Savior doesn't return, but I don't have to fear death. I can have hope even in the face of our own deaths. Whether it comes quicker than we wanted or it's far off in the distance, we don't have to fear it's coming. What grace, hope we don't deserve. Can you believe all that God has done for us? All of that. This just scratches the surface in four short verses. What a foolish errand it is to try and explain the wondrous grace of God and all He's given with my own words, trying to unpack what these mean. God gives us grace on grace on grace on grace for me and for you. He shows us grace when we don't deserve it. And since all of that is true, since Jesus has done all of that to us, and, and we don't deserve any of that. He didn't owe us that. He didn't have to give us that. And yet that's what God does for you and for me. And if that is true, that should change how we interact with other people. That should change how we act when we meet other sinners who don't deserve grace. If we know how little the grace is that we deserve, how little we deserve it, and how much has been given to us, and then we see other sinners who don't deserve any grace either, what should we give them? Wrath, or should we pour out the grace of God on them too because of the joy of what we've been given? If you go back and read those first two verses and then read the rest of it after reading this, you should go, of course, that's how I should act. I should be gentle towards all people. Show perfect courtesy, speaking evil of no one. Man, if anyone's going to speak evil, they should speak evil about me. Look how awful I was without Jesus. But now, because I see the grace, it should change us. If we truly understand the depths of grace, it can and it should lead to good works and showing grace to others. Not because we're trying to earn anything, we realize we can't, but because that's just the fruit of salvation and we cannot help but love others. So we've talked about our work, and that's God's work. Let's talk about the, uh, the enemy's work. Not because that's where I want to go, but that's, that's where verse 8, 9, and 10 goes. So our last blank is that what the enemy does. He tries to resist us from this. The enemy distracts us with worthless work. The enemy distracts us with worthless work. Primarily, one of the things that the enemy wants to do, the enemy of the, our church and the soul, he wants to oppose the work of God. One of the ways that he does this that Paul points out is he does this by dividing us. 
Not just dividing us in our categories of, you know, like, well, you think this and I think that, or our political parties, or our, the team we're going to cheer for in the NFL today, or, or all the other different divisions we can imagine. But he primarily wants to put us into categories of, these are the people who do not deserve any grace, which is obviously not me. And then here's the people, me, who do deserve grace and all the good things of the world, which I'm in, obviously. That's what the enemy wants us to do, but we have to resist his work. Three times, right, again in this chapter, we're told to devote ourselves to good work. In these last couple of verses, it's our good work is contrasted with a different kind of work. The end of verse 8 says, you know, devote yourselves to good works, for these things are excellent and profitable for people. These works that we've been talking about, they're good. They will last into eternity. They please God. They're worthwhile enterprises to spend our limited time on earth engaging in. Instead, there's another kind of work in 9. Work that is, at the end of 9, unprofitable and worthless. It is stuff that distracts us from doing what matters. We can think we're doing important work, but ultimately we're just wasting our time. And we're easily distracted, aren't we, as people? We're easily distracted by plenty of things. Verse 9 speaks about what's distracting the churches in Crete. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissension, and quarrels about the law. They're unprofitable and worthless. Really a lot of that, what are they talking about? Arguments. There's arguments over this. This is what the religious elite like to do in Jesus' day. Like to sit around and argue about nonsense. Like to argue about things. Well, hey, should you heal somebody on the Sabbath? Is that a good thing or is that not a good thing? Because I don't know, healing sounds like work. We know we're not supposed to work. Okay, does picking up a stick for fire count as work? We know you shouldn't make fire, that's work. Well, what if a stick falls out of the tree into your hands? Does that count as work? Then should you go repent? This is the nonsense they would sit around and argue about as if that made them very religious and good and was a worthwhile use of their time. Good thing we don't, you know, argue about anything worthless anymore today, right? <laughs> no. If you want to see worthless arguments, um, just stop by a first uh, semester seminary classroom. You'll find one pretty quickly in there. Um, you could also find one later there. I, I love church history. And so I read the church fathers a lot, or I, I try to. Some of them are easier to understand than others. It's a lot of work. Um, but one thing that repeatedly surprises me is how often on certain questions that all the commentaries are arguing or I'm trying to figure out, you know, you'll come across the church fathers who have gone long before us and they'll say things like, you wicked person, why would you ask that question? You need to repent. I'm like, what? No, I, I thought this was a really interesting question. I'm trying to figure this out. And they say, stop it. Why are you wasting your time with this? Listen and obey God. That's what you should be focusing on. Go love other people. Like, well, I think, it's, you know, God didn't create the sun until the third day, so where did light come from? Was there another light? It... Stop it. That's what the church fathers say things like. And it's just always, you know, why? Because they took this seriously. They were content to just say, hey, God doesn't tell us. Stop wasting your time. Why don't you obey what's clear? Instead of arguing and getting in fights and dividing yourself and doing work that isn't worthwhile. And there are some people who really love to argue, aren't they? There are some people who don't just love to argue, they love to cause division. Verse 10 describes this person. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning them once, which implies warn them, tell them to stop. It's not just kind of, yeah, ignore them. Oh, that's nice. All right. Trying to look for an out of this conversation and say, no, we don't need to argue about that. You need to stop. And then warn them again, twice, have nothing more to do with them. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, they are self-condemned. There are plenty of people like this. They always have a battle to fight. Oh, you wouldn't believe the, the terrible, awful things that people believe now. It's the biggest threat to the church ever. It's different than the threat I told you about last week. This is a new one. No, you've never heard of either of them. Never heard anyone believe it. But we've got to go and start fighting other people about this now. There are people like this who are never satisfied. They will keep splitting every church they are in until the only person left is just them. Because they just want to divide and argue. God's word tells us have nothing to do with that. It's not just don't be people like that. Also, don't have anyone to do, do with anybody who is like that. If you know somebody who is like that, rebuke them, tell them to stop. And then cut them out, kick them out of the church. Have nothing more to do with them. That's how seriously Paul takes that distraction. Because that kind of attitude and talking is worthless and unprofitable. 
And it distracts us from what matters, which is treating other people who are undeserved sinners with the undeserved grace of God, because that's what God has done with us. The beauty of the gospel is that all of us, apart from Jesus, really were worthless people. And yet God decided that we were priceless. And he was willing to give his life for us. Either we like to cause division, right? Or we just hated or hated by all. But Jesus came and he died for us. Jesus came and showed grace to undeserved sinners who didn't deserve anything. So because of that, we should be refused to be distracted from anything that would keep us from loving on sinners and inviting them to come and to follow Jesus with us. So we've been this morning talked about our work. Our work is to treat others like God has treated us. God's work, how did God treat us? He treated undeserved sinners with undeserved, undeserving sinners with undeserved grace. But the enemy tries to distract us with worthless work, engaging in all sorts of arguments about genealogies and whatever the foolish controversy of the day is. What we are to do as believers is to do good works, to treat other people how God's treated us, because of the wondrous grace that God has shown us. If you struggle to understand why, look at God's grace more. Look and reflect and wonder on everything that God has done for you. And let that fuel how you live. I can invite our worship team to come up one more time and lead us as we just sing songs and praise of the God who has saved us. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Lord, it is grace that none of us deserve, that none of us earned or could possibly earn. Lord, thank you for being a God who saves undeserving sinners. Lord, would you help us? We need even more of your grace. I need more of your grace every day that I live. Would you give us more grace and help us show that grace to everyone we meet? Lord, would the gospel flow out of us, out of every pore, out of every word that we speak, out of every interaction we have, out of every act we take, would your grace upon grace upon grace be revealed through us and how we treat other people. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we continue to worship our Savior together. Nothing compares to the promises that we have in Jesus. Um, before I read the benediction or more of his promises to us, I want to just some two quick announcements. Um, we we're going to have an intro to TBF class. Um, so if you are new to TBF or newer, which would pretty much just be anybody who's, we haven't had one of these since I've been here. So if you've been here since I got here, or newer. Um, this is for you. I, there's not a date on it, because um, I want to make sure that everybody who's interested will be able to be there. Um, so if you would like to attend that, we're just going to talk about, you know, kind of the history of the church and who we are, and I'll answer any questions you have or, or things like that. Um, so I'd like you to either sign up in the back or come and talk to me. I want to get a, kind of a head count of who would like to be there, so then we can figure out a date that will work so that everyone can make it. And then next week, we're going to start a new series in the book of Daniel. Um, we're going to be there for about 12 weeks, so it should be fun. Um, I'm a little nervous, less nervous for the first half, more nervous for the second half of it. Um, but Daniel 1 will be fun, so come back next Sunday, and that's what we'll do. But here's our benediction from the end of Ephesians. Um, Peace be to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love uncorruptible. God bless you. Go in peace. <laughs>